want that child. You see this? Now you've heard of the elves from Tennessee use Nesbitt megatrans before, but I want to put this before you before I commit to get ready to preach. This is what the church is commissioned to preach in the largest world that's ever been, the most complex world that's ever been, and in a world where the largest church in the world is in China. Thank you, my brother, for mentioning China. It's under complete duress. And yet the largest church in China, period, largest church in the world is in China. The second largest church in the world is in Russia. Both of those are in negative circumstances. So keep that in mind. The fastest growing religious phenomena in America are, number one, are one. Number two is New Age pantheism and Generation X and through outcomes-based education and media uh, that we're barraged with. Two most powerful influences, no matter what you say, what they say at the North American, or what anybody tells you, the most powerful forces in our cup are not Christian. So it's time for some of God's people to rise up and do battle Amen. with the people that shape the culture that we're in. Amen. And it's in very bad shape. And every counterculture hippie in the 60s is now in Washington doing something there. I don't know why. I'm not even asking because for some time I haven't been able to take Anderson. <laughs> and I used to take those babies and I can't take them anymore so I don't really want to know about what's going on. I know enough and I don't want to know anymore. That's it. But see, my God, our God reigns over the resurrection. And would you please look at this? This sounds like a high school sermon, so please do not be affirmed, because I'm going to try to say something beyond high school. In preaching, what is our dilemma? If we can't identify the audience that we're talking to here or anyplace else, we're not going to talk to them. What's our task? Well, the task is to evangelize the Lord. We've heard that. We've said that. I'm not Very few people believe it, but they'll give raise holy hands and say, Amen, brother, Amen. I said, what are you doing about it? Well, what do you mean, what am I doing about it? I don't know what you mean. That's what I figured out in the first place. That's why I asked him. What's our task? Over five billion people, most of whom have never, ever heard of Jesus, let alone said no about him or yes to him. Never even heard. So if the church doesn't get off its theological duff and get rid of its theological myopia, it can't be the church, but God will get somebody to do it. He always has. Yeah, that's right. See, our God reigns. Now, whether he reigns here or not, I need a couple more days. Then I tell you. You wouldn't want to know what I tell you, but I tell you anyway. What's our framework? What's our promise and what's our goal? Take that off. Now, if I were preaching to high school, we would go through ne megatrends. Have you ever heard of Nesbitt's megatrend? You haven't? I don't want to hear it if you haven't. Thank you very much. But that book was written a long time ago, and every one but one of his cultural analysis have been fulfilled. I'd almost put it next to Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Acts 17. But I don't believe he's a prophet. I just believe he had enough information to accurately predict. And if, you, if you've never read that book, that could change your life positively. Now look at that. Now this is high level material. The, uh, good to some elitist Harvard uh, Phi Beta Kappa and then Nerdsville. Now several of them live in a, con a community of nerds. Well, here's the next one. You read that on your own. Now, I've got to go. Bob, you take that baby off of there, would you believe? <laughs> now, look at this. We're talking since 1960. Most of you weren't even born then. But from 1946 to 1964, 70 million births, live births, in America alone. That was over one-third of the population. Now, they're called in jargon terms, in demographic analysis and psychological pep talks uh, as Generation X. They're the generation that rebelled against God. That's the generation that knew not Joseph. Mm -hmm. They abandoned the Bible as normative, eternal truth. 
Postmodernism denies that there is any true truth. I want to try, if you can stay tonight, I want to show you that every issue in Acts 17 is exactly postmodern multicultural structure of our society. Amen. And the Apostle Paul, well over two years ago, took that on and it's back with us. And it's because the people of God have done nothing about it. Amen. And I want to encourage you to get off of your theological ducks and do something about it. Anyway, this is just a very simple little thing about a generation uh, that's a third of America. Now, Grandma, she doesn't know. She knows nothing about Gerda's serum. She knows nothing about Behe's black box, which is the direct attack on naturalistic evolution. If you haven't read Behe's book, you can't be saved, I believe. Darwin's black box. Did I bring what did I do with those things? Yeah, I've got it out of here. I'm not selling books. I'm trying to get you... Oh, you're done. How many of you, and I will preach if you can stay, how many have ever heard or seen this book? Now look at that. Way over one. We have a majority of one person out of 75 or 80. Heavenly Father, what only God can do with it. What this man is, is a Roman Catholic geneticist. And what he has done is taken on the whole genetic foundation of naturalistic evolution to the very root of it. And I wrote him and called him on, and I said, if that holds up under scientific analysis, that's the most important book written in the 20th century. Get that book. And if not, why not? Now, another book, huh? it looks like I'm selling books. A book, uh, some of you, those of us who went to North America and heard an enormous amount of postmodern hermeneutical messages, and I'll tell you what those names were. Thomas Kuhn is the high priest in his, his structure of scientific revolution. What that is, he talks about paradise. Who ever heard of a such a weird word as that? But the radical change in thought. Now, Christianity created a radical change in thought when a bunch of riffraff took on the Greco Roman Empire and in three and a half centuries brought it to its knees. With no Harvard Phi Beta Kappas and no Oxford PhDs and microscopic physics and no geneticists. How do you do that? Well, do it again, God. Another book. Because postmodernism denies there's any structure in the universe and nothing normative, Bible or anything else. Have you ever heard of Douglas Gruthius? That is not an Irish Catholic priest, you understand that? Douglas Gruthius. If you know anything at all, which you might not you know he's not an Irishman. What the soul of cyberspace? Now what this is is a direct attack on the influence of the computer informational revolution in our culture. Now postmodernism denies that there's any structure or any true truth, and yet the simplest computer is linear, highly structured. Mm -hmm. Now that's a contradiction in our culture, the thing that creates information revolution is structured, and our culture denies that there's any structure. So I want to suggest to them, they're going to give up one of those two things. This is also not a Christian book, Postmodernism and the Social Science. Because postmodernism at the university, outcomes based education and media, generally operates in the social behavioral sciences. This is not a Christian book, but when we can't do it, God gets somebody else to write it. That's a tremendous book directly attacking the whole foundation of social thought from Duke University to Duke Pikes Peak Bible College. Now this, you didn't come for all these, but I'm not selling books. I'm encouraging them to get some. Higher superstition, this is from Australia. Almost nothing is from Australia. <laughs> so I praise God for this. This is a direct attack and every major university in the Western world of revisionist history. There is no such thing as true history. There's just, you're way really looking at it. Well, this is a non-Christian trying to defend the rationality of doing history. So you don't talk about the resurrection or Os Guinness's evidence and demands of birth. There's no such thing as that. You're talking to yourself. Quit talking to yourself because you don't advance it very often doing that. Then higher superstition is a direct attack on a fundamental influence in our culture. Who gives a who? I'm going to pass that by because you've got to go home. Uh, this, this is on history. This book right here is on history. That's on the social sciences. 
Have you ever heard, no, that I'm putting him by. Have you ever heard, no, this baby goes the way of all flesh, all these. Here's Nesbitt's book, Mega Trends. Everybody talks about those, you know. If, if you've been to any place, somebody's talked about that. This man's not a Christian. But he's meticulously accurate analysis of our culture. And all but one of the things, of the 20 things he predicted, have been fulfilled. Now that's right in the midst of the church. How did that happen? Because the church just met together and talked to themselves. Instead of worshiping God, we worship each other. We've turned worship into worship wars into entertainment. Are we having fun? I'm not going back to this long-winded nonsense. And did we like things? I didn't ask you if you liked it. I asked you if you believed it. Now that's enough. Almost anything's enough for you people. Now one more thing. Have you ever heard of John Poking Horn? Now I want you to hold down the excitement level because it gets out of control. If two or three people just started a frenzy, then, then what would I do when I started to preach? Now Poking Horn is one of two conservative Episcopalians in the world. Number one. Number two, he's a world-class microscopic physicist and an Episcopalian priest. If he take off his inverted collar and his black, I've seen some black coats around here, I thought I was in an undertaker's convention. But anyway, Pokey Mark could preach it at the Kaimichis and they wouldn't know the difference. But he's world-class microscopic physicist. You know, who cares? He defends creation. He defends the very heart of the gospel. So there are big time people. There are the babies and the poking horn. So don't be bamboozled at the university or some dummy teaching at the high school in physics or chemistry or math that we don't believe these things. These are beyond intelligent people's belief. And the French word for that is la bunk. <laughs> the French language always contains in its nominal structure always a definite article. That is the law. Now the 17th chapter of Acts, preaching to a generation. Now quickly these and then we'll preach. At the heart, Paul was in Athens. Now at that time, now Corinth was the New York, was the Oxford and Cambridge. But Athens was the intellectual center of the Greek or Roman world. Now you remember, because you've known this when you used up, Peter on the day of Pentecost preached. And he got 2,000 out of Josephus says 10 million people, that's a preacher's guess. They didn't know, they didn't count them, but say something like that. Well, 2,000 out of 10 million is one tenth of one percent. That simply meant that God had spent 2,000 years to raise Israel to hear about the Messiah, and just one tenth of one percent of the audience heard it. And then he had some fishermen. Can you imagine, in the social structure of that Jewish world, fishermen preaching in public, speaking in public, and trying to convert people to the Messiah? That's totally unacceptable, politically incorrect. Now you know that. That's preaching in the Jewish context. Because we're going to get to worldviews. That's a naughty word, I'm sure you think that. Now, then Stephen. Now, do my best to avoid... The Stephen syndrome. You know, right after he preached, they killed him. <laughs> I, I want to avoid that if I possibly can. Now Stephen was preaching to a Jewish audience. You know that. You, you know the little fact. Now Paul comes to Athens. That's Greek or Roman. He's in a different world. Now notice what he doesn't do. When you're in the Jewish world that believes the Bible, they go through the Bible to present Jesus in the Bible. But when he's in a different worldview, he doesn't say, sit down, let's study Isaiah, and I'm pointing to Hebrew. <laughs> or let's study the first 11 chapters of Genesis. No, 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 no. Here's what he did. Now, in the audience that day, now the Areopagus was the elite meeting place of the intellectuals. Now, Grandma wasn't there. But Grandma almost never changes the world. She hardly ever changes her mind, let alone the world. So we're talking about playing hardball for God. Now, Paul was the Areopagus. Now, what is the Areopagus? What's the Harvard Yard, if that is? 
not meaningful, it's still the Harvard Yard. And he mentioned the resurrection. Do you understand that the worldview of his audience couldn't possibly accept any resurrection talk? Number one, he starts and stops with the resurrection, but all in between is over worldview analysis that makes possible listening about the resurrection. Now, I was going to bring you the magnificent poems of William Crane's doctoral thesis on the resurrection of Jesus, but not one, one word in 900 pages of very thinly printed material at Oxford does he ever mention that the cause of people not hearing about the resurrection of Jesus was over worldviews or science. It's not over getting A in the Greek. It's over a whole thought pattern that they can't hear. I said... Bill, do you not know that you did brilliant work? That, oh, I said, I, I thought I was brilliant. I said, I want to humiliate you just a little bit. If you were just a little bit more brilliant, you would have taken on what caused the problem in the first place. Instead of writing 900 pages of material that only, if you're talking to yourself, is anybody going to listen to that? I want to play hardball. And we'll talk about that. But Paul's audience, now put that Audience analysis isn't a big thing in, in holidays now. Oh, we've got to analyze those audiences. So you see your friends. <laughs> oh my God. I can't take Anderson. I want you to know that, or I wouldn't even mention it, let alone discussing it. Anyway, the audience determines the message, not the word of God in secret friendly mode. We've shifted from authoritative word from God to the authority of the community that listens to us. Now that's the very essence of what postmodernism is. It's not over pre-ante or any of that nonsense. That's semantic nonsense to me. Now Paul talked to an audience that were naturalists. Now what's that mean? There's nothing in the world but nature. Now keep that down. See that's so we get the sermon. He has meticulous knowledge of his audience. Now what is this Jewish scholar trained at the feet of the elite Jewish rabbis. You know that. You've known that from your youth. Uh, what's he doing? Knowing with meticulous accuracy every point, every point of the worldview of his audience. Because if he's going to talk to different worldview than Jews, he's got to understand the thought pattern of that system. And providentially, this Jew, he knows it. Well, don't tell me that he failed and then at Corinth he said he'd give up on that philosophizing he's going to preach in Christ. The only mistake that makes is a mistake both about what's in the 17th chapter of Acts and in the Corinthian epistle. Amen. Other than that, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> now, they were naturalists. They denied creation. Now, what that? Because he's going to take that on. See, if there's no creation, there's no God that creates. So don't talk about the resurrection if you've already locked God out of the universe. Amen. You can study till you're blue in the face and get A in the Greek text of the resurrection purpose in the New Testament and most people don't give a hoot about that. But if I take them to the ground in their thought system, you might get an audience with them and I don't have an audience with them now. Well, they were naturalists. They were material. The only thing that's real is matter. Nothing matters but matter. The Bible denies that. Paul, crystal clear, takes his audience to task from beginning to end. He starts with a resurrection and ends with a resurrection. Now, three things separate Christianity from all the world's religions. It's resurgent non-Christian religion and all the classical non-Christian religions. And that is the incarnation. And if you were a hard-nosed physicist from Harvard or MIT or Oxford or Cambridge, would you believe that a 17-year-old virgin Jew would be pregnant? Not if your brain is horizontal on both hemispheres, would you believe that? But if there's a God, He created that, that's no problem. Amen. But if you don't believe in that God, that's a problem immediately. And we're the bright ones and you're the your Bible thump, but I got to Southern Illinois where we did rot gut gin and we had a hanging right after church every Sunday, right after lunch. See, I know all about that. Who read next? My 
come, redneck territory. I try to escape that. I only acknowledge, I don't say rednecks among the redneck, because that's not seeker friendly. <laughs> they don't ask me back. I said, what are all you rednecks doing here? I said, what? <laughs> Elizabeth, I'm gone. They were naturalists, they were materials. Now watch this, they were universals. Well, now one of the marks of postmodernism is that everybody's in. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Calvinist, but the Bible denies that everybody's in. Amen. And only those who believe in a crucified, risen Lord can possibly enter the kingdom of God. And we, we had glory song. We sang that. Some of you did, some of you did. Some of you sang very badly. I don't want you to sing in public again. We sang these praise hymns. But see, if God didn't create the universe, why are we all praising? He's like praising you. Why do you do that? See, I praise the creator of the universe. I expect the DNA to be complex because he created it. Amen. I expect linear and chaos physics to be complex because he created it. But if there is no God who created it, then don't talk about the resurrection or coming to church. Because the church is a dead horse unless you like to ride around on a dinosaur. <laughs> they were naturalists. They were universalists. And just one more. There's actually seven points in this audience, but I don't want you to have those. And they believe that only the Stoics had the truth. Their research Gnosticism is, is postmodernism. But we're smart, and you're the dummies. That's possible. I understand what you're saying. I don't believe it. But Paul understood every fundamental assumption of the worldview of that audience. Now, had he not, if he just quoted the Old Testament or preached like Peter or Stephen, they'd have got up on that. They said, we're not even going to listen to the second preacher. We're not even going to listen to the first one. Now, he understood the thought pattern. That's fundamental. I've been saying so because... You preach till midnight, and I see these very strange windows. You don't have money to have classical windows in for anybody to fall out. I understand that. Uh, I think people don't have the money here to buy those windows, but uh, Paul preached till midnight, and brethren and sister and fell out of the windows. They were trying to get out, and they fell out of the windows. <laughs> I'd like for you to think that Dr. Kirk, you see these things? Now, any witness in 1997 is going to have to understand the whole worldview analysis of Acts 17 as a model for preparation to preach to a generation that doesn't believe almost anything, even if they go to church, even if they're in the pulpit, even if they teach in Bible colleges or seminaries. There's very little belief in any of those places. Well, they have beliefs. The issue is what they are. Watch them. Now, a witness must be observed. Here's Paul. Put this down. It's quite simple. Don't be offended by the simplicity. Observe. That means he observed. Now what the text says, you were there when you heard this story read. He walked all over hands. And he perceived. Now they had temples coming out of their ears. They were religious way up past here. It wasn't that they weren't religious. They were very religious. They had gods for everything. Gods and goddesses. Now we have resurgent goddesses in the churches. And resurgent radical feminism is resurgent pagan goddessism. <laughs> Very little question about that. Now at the heart, Paul said he walked all over town. No tracks. No head protectors. Didn't have a hundred voice choir. And didn't have a hundred member orchestra. How on earth can he carry on a meeting without all that stuff? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. If you don't want to talk to anybody, you have those things. If you want to talk to the people that play hardball, then something else I can tell you. But if you want to entertain them, but don't confuse worship with entertainment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. That's an entirely entertainment is audience oriented. Worship is not oriented. Yeah. Those are not synonyms. And they're deep in our heritage and out of our heritage. Deep 
Were you here when I said D? Oh, I want you to remember that. Now, what he did was look all around town. See, you're very religious. And he found a temple to an unknown God. Now, watch what he's doing. Point of contact, understanding his audience, observing. Now, Paul, he didn't constitute reality. He observed it. <laughs> he said, I see there's a temple to an unknown God. See, they had temples for everybody, and they were so brilliant, they said, in case we miss one, we put one to an unknown God. Now, he said, I'd like to talk to you a little while. I want to talk to you about this unknown God. Now, you claim that you have a worldview that's open to this unknown God. I'm going to tell you about that God. Now, when I tell you about that God, he's going to get rid of all the other gods. Yes. Now, you, that you won't like. That's not a secret friend in meeting. He's not coming back next year, I know that. Observe it. Now, when we want to talk to people, are we observant about their circumstance, their thought patterns, their behavior patterns, what they think and why? Why? That's very important. Uh, I mentioned, I was going to mention the, the 12 top homiletics books taught at the universities and, and seminaries in our culture. And no wonder that even homilies are going postmodern. That stories and narratives and all that. Because biblical content doesn't get an audience. You ever tried an hour sermon, sight reading the Greek text of Romans, and have 13 sermons in Romans, and people stand up and say, More, more, don't, don't stop, go on! You have to be a stand up comedian. Here's, here's, here's the thing I give you for this observation. I ask you, and then I'll check on you later. Not tonight, but I'm leaving. Praise God. We are praying, sir. We're praising God for that. But I want you to examine. Have you ever heard of Jay Leno? You know who that is? I mean, is that... Is it? Jay Leno is a modern communicator. Now, a modern communicator, you can tell what he's saying. Now, another man, who is the other big age? Now, don't all tell me once. David Letterman is a postmodern communicator. If you want to know the people that influence the culture in and out of the church, you do a, a, an analysis of Jay Leno and David Letterman. And emergency room almost creep. Changes, everything changes, nothing is in continuity, nothing is ordered. Well, that's postmodern, nothing is ordered. You can analyze media, you can analyze education, you can analyze the whole structure of our, our, our society and find out that it's postmodern, which means anyone that holds on to some truth is a bigoted Bible thumping redneck. Southern Illinois or Missouri, Mississippi or Alabama, Delhi. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell them that all the dummies are not in Mississippi or Alabama. Mm -hmm. Amen. They say, what? How much gall can hit? I said, yeah, I have plenty. Some people have more gall than ruptured gall better. But I tell them, and I've told you before, I've been thrown out of better places than that. Now, witnessing to the risen Christ at Athens and in our world, it's one thing to say, hey, you got A in the final exam of a test that I gave on Stoic philosophy, and you could go to hell. But if you took, if you took to pass the man that prepared to speak to that audience, then you might be changed forever. But I'm not just talking about useless information. Outcomes-based education is not for information, it's to get you a job. I said, I got too many jobs now, I don't need another job. <laughs> Observant, any witnesses, now or then, then or now, must be, what do you observe? Whatever's going on. <laughs> Put that down, think about that. Now another thing, a witness must be concerned with other people. Now, you must be concerned with people that have no intrinsic value. Uh, people said, well, you make me feel 
uncomfortable. I said, you came uncomfortable. I didn't make you feel that way. You make me feel like I'm worthless. No, I didn't make you worthless. You came that way. The only place that some people I know are worthy in ain't is the God that created the universe and says that you're worth something. Not your GPA or your wealth, but that you're in his image. So most people aren't worth anything except God. The only place that most people can get any self-esteem is that they're going to God and get it. Of course, they haven't got any intrinsic cultural or intellectual source of that or wealth or anything else that we identify in our culture. You've got to have, kids have to have two Lexuses at the poor man's Rolls Royce. And I tell you, one greed perimeter of my life, if someone wanted to give me a Lexus at the poor man's Rolls Royce, I would take it. Now, if you don't give me any, I will never have any. Just put it that way. I just say, well, I know a lot of people that don't want me to have one. See, because my self-image is not contingent on whether I've got a Rolls Royce or a Lexus. Amen. See, I came into this world with nothing, and I bet either one of my arms that I've exited the same way. Amen. So what do we think we're going to do? But anyway, look at that. Conquer must be concerned with others. Now, in a world where some people really intrinsic, psychologically, aren't worth very much. If that offends you, so be it. But see, God says that you are. I know prostitutes, alcoholics, drug addicts, church members, elders and deacons and preachers that aren't really worth very much. But God said, you're so valuable that I sent my son. That means you have intrinsic worth. Mm -hmm. Not how many stocks and bonds you've got. I need lots of money. Uh, several of you asked me about that. In the last few days when the stock market goes, whoosh, I may be a million there before I get home. Well, I went crazy. But that's not who I am. That's not where I've been or where I'm going. Witnessing to the risen Christ is not just going through the records of the New Testament about the resurrection credit or units. It's affirming a brand new life that enables, enables all believers to have a worldview to take this world by storm. If God created it, man tries to take it from him and redemption is getting every inch of the universe back. Amen. Everything about this universe, our literature, certain, whatever it is, name it, make a list of it. God wants every inch of that. It's all his. And he'll have it one way or another. Amen. Amen. So what do we have to observe? Just we have myopia. You know what that is. You know it's, it's, it's a bit part of the world. Well, if that's a shock to you, most of the world isn't there. Huh? So to arm the church in 1997 is to arm it with a lot of observers, witnesses. Like Martin Newman, I've mentioned before, and you've heard other people tell you about that. Martin Niemeyer was put on the house arrest because he was a witness for Jesus when Hitler's notorious infliction of pain and death on the world. The young ones don't even remember that and hate history. And the history team, that's what you do when you can't do anything else. You teach history. You're out of work. But it keeps them off the street. Brad. Well, here's what Hitler said about Martin Miller. He told the SS guards not to allow the same guard to guard him two days in a row. Because he was too dangerous a witness. Oh my God, I wish I were that dangerous a witness. We can't allow the prime SS guard regarded twice because he might tell them about Jesus. Have you ever heard anything like that? Observing? If we're not observing what's going on in the world, we're not prepared. That's all. It's quite clear. And the world is not just a little tiny world that we live in. Now, 
our dear friends drove down here and I've been here before. We saw at least 12 walnut. Now the world's coming apart. And we got at least 12. I quit counting. Because I could only count the 12, so I quit. Why would there be 12 businesses selling walnut gold? Thing that there's some of them, it's another thing, enough people must have to buy them to stay in business. So I got two batches of nerds. <laughs> and then another thing I observed you have at least 100, and I quit counting, there may be more. I, uh, this is not a mathematical calculation. I computerized and popped that baby right off there, give me a fax on it. I counted 100 people selling fireworks. What? How can a hundred businesses stay in business selling fireworks? Now it is true in Illinois, you can't sell them, but they got them anyway. You can't tell people not to do what they're going to do. I don't care what the law said, they're going to pop. Man. Observe what you saw. Oh, if you just wanted to let me have the time, and I told you what I saw coming down here that's a clue to what's going on in our world. But I gave you an assignment. You compare. Now, I'm not asking you to not read the Bible, not study, and not go to church and, and come to meetings like this, but watch and compare Jay Leno and the other guru. They're completely exactly. One's a modern communicator, one's a postmodern communicator. And they both laugh about both of them. But no one who talks about the risen Christ has an audience like either one of those communicators. As a matter of fact. Because not one of those communicators asks anyone on the audience, internet, or any form, to do anything about what you're hearing. What's at variance with the gospel? The gospel is not just to be preached to see if you like the points. No one didn't like it. I hate the preacher. I hate it all. But the gospel is to ask for a decision. Amen. Because this is not a preacher talking. This is God talking. Amen. Amen. The God who created the world. And if he created the world, then I'm not surprised that a 17-year-old unmarried Jewish girl could be pregnant. But if there's no God, that would surprise me no end. In fact, I wouldn't believe it. Huh? Or, if there's no God, I wouldn't believe that Lazarus laughed or that Jesus rose from the dead. That's not possible. But if there's a God that created the world, what's the problem? Amen. The problem is not over what the Bible says. The problem is over the worldview of the people that listen to it. Amen. So if you want to preach and you want the kids to go to the university and get an A minus or F plus in physics or chemistry, they're going to be bombarded with all those assured results of scientific information and only nerds can be a Christian. That is not true. Now it's largely true. That's why it's so unfortunate. But it isn't necessarily true. And I want to encourage you in that direction. But observe. What do we need to observe? Everything that we're around. Of course, everything is about God's word. And we want to know why God has no influence here, there, there. Where is that? Well, if God wanted to come to church, he could come to church. We tell him when church is on. <laughs> oh. It's illegal to meet in China. Do you know where those fools meet anyway? Well, they meet out in the woods. But if the police caught them. But they're growing. No seeker friendly Chinese churches that I've ever seen. Those are all American. Uh, those are all yuppie churches. Now nothing because yuppies are lost too. I didn't say that. But don't take that as a norm for what God's doing in the world. That's all I'm saying. Amen.
That's just one small issue of God. My God's much bigger than that. that if God's no bigger than that, he's pretty small. It's not up to deal with, he said. A third thing, witness must be prepared. Ah, oh, prepared for what? Students. Come, means it. People have asked me, said, how many students do you have? I said, well, about one out of 20. <laughs> said, what? You talked about my son and daughter like that? I said, if you've got one like that, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. Prepare. Well, what do you want to do as a Christian? What do you want to do in the marketplace? What do you want to do at the school? What do you want to do wherever you are? If you identify that, then I can tell you how to prepare to tell about Jesus in that place. But if you're not sure what you want to do, I don't know what to tell you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you went to medical school, now that you have to play hardball, you know, F pluses, GPAs don't get in medical school, okay? Does that make sense to you? Now, in medical school, it's not seeker friendly. They don't have, when you don't know what you're doing, you get a committee together to decide, and five out of 12 is a good average. But see, when you're doing, I mentioned that to you, most of you know anyway. Five years ago, I was in the eight hours for quadruple bypass. And there wasn't one postmodern surgeon in that room. <laughs> Twelve nurses and eight doctors. Thirty-two blue codes. And that technology was not postmodern technology. Gotcha. But postmodernism denies that there is such a thing. Mm. I say there's also no postmodern metallurgist. Mm. Have you ever been on a half a billion dollar airplane and said, well, we don't know whether to fly or not, but I'll get on there anyway. <laughs> See, nobody in the real world is a postmodernist. It's all the dummies at the university. Now, postmodernist is not just pre-post, uh, that nonsense. You know, people talk like that, anti-modern, whatever that means. But a postmodern, one who denies there is truth, is not merely unavailable to us, it doesn't exist. Well, that isn't exactly all right with the Christian position. So I better be concerned about, I, I was going to ask it. I have ten books that are that are Bibles of the postmodern mind. Have you ever heard of that card? Uh, I guess not. <clears> that <throat> is the origin and point of epistemology of postmodernism. You say you never heard of them? Well, that's not surprising to me. But they're still the godfathers of postmodern thought. And Leotard is the most quoted book in the past 20 years in the Western world. And you haven't read it. It's French. French connection. You used to have German connection, French connection, you know all those connections. Witness? If you think you're going to deal with postmodern mind and you don't know Leotard or Gadamer and, and, and hermeneutics, you're talking to yourself. What's that got to do with being saved? I didn't say you needed to sight read 700 pages of technical French that have two page, they have two page sentences. That doesn't sound like IDS telling you that you got to have very short sentences and very clear to the audience so they won't understand. <laughs> Preaching's got to be short and funny or I'm out of here. Well, those men shape postmodern homiletics. And I do not know, I'm sure there are millions, but I do not know one person who teaches homiletics in our heritage that is conversant with Leotard and Gadamer. And they teach people to preach. They're teaching them to talk to themselves. Because they're not prepared. To shape preachers of the gospel in a world that doesn't believe a word of the Bible. Now, we do. I want to tell you that so you, you 
you wouldn't shoot me just tonight. But I don't believe the Bible just because I believe the Bible. I have lost my mind in spite of widespread heretical dissemination of heretical information. That child is already upset. It's postmodern child. <laughs> now, a witness must be careful. Now, that's all of us, me, you. Now, a tactful person isn't the person that is tolerant. The hot button in Pokemon is being tolerant of everything. You tolerate everything. Now, being tactful is not being tolerant. If you went to trigonometry class and you solved equations and teachers tolerant and said, well, this, this doesn't seem like a, a classical answer to that, but I love you and I don't want to hurt your little psyche and your comfort zone, so that's okay. That is your perception of it. You ever heard of a mathematics teacher doing that? But you go to church and you don't want to offend anybody in church. See, I told people, I have advanced degrees in offending people. <laughs> I've studied for 25 years to intentionally offend them. You've got to get hold of them some way. If I wanted to be a comedian, it's a million dollars a minute. I would have done that 20 years ago. But, but Now, don't tell me that Wayne Smith's a comedian. He's a redneck. He's not. Someone, they, they you know, $50 a piece to roast. I wouldn't give $50 for Wayne Smith. Let alone a roast. No, he's not a comedian. He's sick. Now, witness must be prepared. Prepared. What's that? Whatever, whoever we want to talk to, that's what we got to know. See, I don't know who you're going to talk to, but if you're going to avoid talking to everybody in the world, you don't need to know lots of things. Huh? Does that make sense? <laughs> so, see, I don't need to know that. Well, then I already know who you're going to try to talk to. But if you tell me who you're going to talk to, I can talk to you more about what you need to know. Be prepared. Now, I don't mean go to church and go to camp and, and hum and bail for Jesus' sake, but being prepared is to be armed for battle. Amen. Whatever that is. See, I don't know because I don't know the audience. But if you came with me down to Los Alamos where they do international hardball nonlinear physics, there are 4,000 scientists down there that know all there is in the world about their subject. But there are 20 Christians down there. And the world's leading, now here it is, some of you want to know it. You're going to preach later. The world's leading plate tectonic specialist. What's that? He does geological analysis of the plate structure of the earth. Plate tectonic, he didn't want to know that either. But see, he could preach at the Kaimichis and they wouldn't know the difference. That man is tolerated at Los Alamos because he is the chief plate tectonic specialist in the world. And he's a Christian. And he said, oh, and he's very humble. You think he's retired? Well, he said, very humble. Yeah, you, 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 you have to hit him in the nose to get his attention. But he says this not belligerent. He says, I know all there is to know about plate tectonics, and I don't know enough to lose my faith. So can you imagine where the rest of me are? You just don't know anything about it. And you get geologists at the university and high school telling kids that evolution's a kid. That's fine. There are high-level minds in the world that are prepared to be used of God. And at least 20 of those 4,000 scientists of Los Alamos meet every Monday for Bible study. And do you know what those fools read last year? I don't know what they're doing this year, but I haven't been there this year. Where they're reading Veet's book on a postmodern mind. These international beings. These are not jack leg PhDs from Harlan and Physics. These are trendsetters, not followers. And they're studying the Bible and say, hey, we have failed in our scientific witness to Jesus Christ because we've got to examine the worldview that's involved in our communication and not merely information. Because you can get an atheist with as much information as you've got. That's not where the issues are. Now, you don't want to not have the information, but that's not where the hardball is in witnessing. We want to be a witness for Christ. How do you witness? 
A witness is one who bears testimony. And a testimony and a witness is one that's informed. You don't want lying witnesses or uninformed witnesses, do you? I don't think so. Tactful? Now, biblical preaching is always asked for a verdict, and that's not politically correct. Mm -hmm. Amen. There's no communicator if you analyze media geniuses in communication. Not one of the hot button people in communication. Ask anybody for a decision. Or say, now before I close in tonight, do you believe what I've said? But you go to church and some dummy there said, now we're all going to sing an invitation hymn. Biblical preaching of the resurrection is verdict theology. Mm -hmm. Amen. Paul came to Athens. He preached the resurrection, but only reincarnationism. Now, when did reincarnationism re-enter our culture as a powerful instrument? I don't mean what day, but approximately what decade? I can't wait for you, the 60s. Still with us. Yeah. Now there are people that believe in reincarnation, but not in the resurrection. Yes. But the resurrection is not reincarnation. Amen. That's right. We have, we have, I think it is, we have a show about angels, but not about God. Do you know that that's New Age pantheism? Yes. Do you know that every major science fiction item since since Campbell's uh, The Power of Myth was written, Jurassic Park, Jerome, all, all the, all the are, are New Age pantheists. Do you know that? Every one of them. I would only say that because they made billions of dollars with me. Millions of people watch it and like it. And they have any idea what they've seen. As for a verdict, what verdict? Paul preached, but see, analyzing the 17th chapter of Acts requires meticulous knowledge of the story. Now, he never even mentions one line of the Epicureans. Not one time. They were not seeker friendly. Every issue of the 17th chapter of Acts in that message, Paul was taking on the worldview of his audience, which means he had to know what it was. But he wasn't trying to substitute. Harvard Phi Beta Kappa philosophizing and preaching. And then he goes to Corinth and says, I tried that at Athens, but I gave that up for Lent. Now I'm just going to preach. No, 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 no. Misunderstand both passages of Scripture. Yes. Now he preached Christ. See, when he preached to that pagan audience, they were no more open to the resurrection than when he got done. But I'm sure they were shaken to their knees. What is this Jewish itinerant witness doing knowing our thought pattern? He not only knew it, but he quoted from he quoted from a line from Eratus from a quatrain, yes, a pantheistic poem. What is this Jewish preacher doing quoting pagan poetry? Well, he was telling that audience that he understood where they came from. They didn't get into standing ovation. Oh, you need that quatrain from Eric. Oh, no, 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 no. He started with the resurrection and he ends with the resurrection. Now, it is true that just a few people came, but notice one. And sometimes that one changes the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not an elitist. But he won one, and that's for our simple time tonight. What was one of those converts? He converted one of the biggies yeah. from the intellectual center of Athens. Now, as a matter of fact, I believe people like that, or like Beatty, or like Dr. Baumgartner, have more influence than thousands of people. Now, if that sounds chauvinistic and elitist, everybody doesn't have influence. As a matter of fact, well, you've offended me because my grandmother thinks she's got a lot of 
influence. Well, she may have a lot of influence over you, but you're nobody, see. <laughs> We're talking about changers of the world because this is God's world. If we don't get hold of the shakers, we're not going to get hold of the shaker. <clears throat> I didn't say that they were worth more. I say they're more influential. And they're not any more or less saved or lost. They're just more influential. Very few people here tonight have any influence beyond your own home. But there are people, Paul's one of them, Beatty's another, Bob Gardner's another, Pokehorn's another, and I can mention more than you want to hear. God has people all around this world that can play hardball, and they're Christians, and they're never too busy to be in church, isn't that something? Okay. The busiest you can get. The busiest heart surgeon in Springfield never misses church. He said, I'll be there when I get done. There are people to do that. And no one complains, at least in public, about that. He said, I, I'm going to be with my brother and sister. I'll be back. Are there, are there witnesses like that today, here? Acts 17 is a singly, in my stomach, I'm sure it's wrong, but I'll go to my grave not believing so, singly most important apologetic passage in the New Testament is Acts 17. If you're going to preach the risen Christ, you've got to make sense out of that claim in a context of a worldview in which it makes sense. That doesn't mean you've converted them all, but you won't convert them at all without that. Preach Christ. Preach the risen Christ. I said a long time ago, three things separate Christianity from all the world religions. The incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. And if those three any one of the three are jeopardized, Christianity loses its message. That's right. All you have to do is do a genetic analysis of the bones that you found in his grave. Yeah, I think those are Jesus of Nazareth. One crystal clear evidence nobody's ever found it. If you've ever been to biblical Palestine, it wouldn't take too long to go over to Palestine. Fine. You couldn't do it in Palestine unless you weren't looking. All you have to do is find him, and I say, I don't believe. But until you do, I do believe. Lord, help my and our unbelief. Amen. <laughs> Believing in Christ. It's the most exciting thing in the world. Amen. Amen. Because it's the only thing that makes sense of the total world. I don't care whether it's genetics, biology, physics, astronomy. I don't care what it is. Even high school camp. Or church. See, many churches that I've been in over the years, I know that there's a God because only God could survive. They're living proofs of God's existence. You see that? You know anything like that? See, if you won't play hardball, I can help you. But if you don't want to, just go on and do what you're doing. It's time to have a generation that knows Joseph, not a generation that doesn't know Joseph. Is that the generation that's here? Is that why this meeting, preaching convention exists? Preaching to ourselves? When Paul got done, he had a small conversion mode 
He wouldn't turn that into the standard at all. Had three cards. Oh, you had a bad music. If you had better music, better preaching, you'd probably want them all. Mm. But the people he won might have changed the whole structure of the universe. I pray to God that he would give me power to have converted an Einstein. Or someone who made a difference that would transform whole structures of society. Oh, to God that he would give me power to convert Bernstein. <laughs> he, he sets over our money. You know that, baby. But if he's a Christian, he can change the economic structure of the world. Just by a phone call. Jesus would make all the difference in the world. But he is not a believer. So he acts and makes economic decisions like he's in control. But I have news for him. He is not. But if he had his life on the line for Jesus, what a difference it would make. Have you and I made any differences in the world we live in? Let's don't have just another message on the resurrection and then go away like nothing happened. See if it happened. It's a singly, besides his birth, most important event in the history of the world. But you can act like it isn't, but not forever. Because the one who created me songs and quarks and black holes in outer space created you and me. Amen. Yes. Preaching. Preaching's for on bad days. This, if I conclude, praise God for this termination of this diary. When I'm regularly preaching about 70 weeks a year, I repeatedly carried a golf ball. No, I don't play golf. I played golf, and I was down 78. That's not too bad. But if I wasn't going to be good, I quit. I wasn't going to do any of that business. If I couldn't be top notch, I wasn't going to play. I don't want to do 70 or 80 in golf. I don't beat anybody. I don't need to play golf, and I'm too busy to play. But I still have some golf ball. You say, you do? I don't give a hoot about that at all. Well, yeah, you, you know what a golf ball is. You do know what that would be if you ever heard or saw it. Well, a micro dot on a golf ball, a micro dot, which highly technical electronic equipment to see it, is the size of the Earth in the solar system. Now, what that means is that this Earth is quite small. Whatever else it needs. Now, how do you get so much arrogance and hate and hostility? I used to carry around, and it was illegal, used to carry around a handful of dust that was a former body. I got that because I had friends in the business. The largest person in this room wouldn't be a handful of dust. I had this handful of dust, and I would throw it up at the world. The air, and said, you see that? That's somebody. Oh no, they didn't ask me to come back and speak again. <laughs> but the point is, the earth's not very big, and if a human being just a handful of dust, why worry about it? But if a human being is a great deal more than a handful of dust, worry about it to no end. And isn't it marvelous? God creates a universe so complex and so large, the earth, our home, is a micro dot on a golf ball. You and I cannot even perceive the, the micro dimension of that. So how do you get war and hate and hostility and animosity? And the creator of the universe chose the earth. No, there's not extraterrestrial intelligence. No. He chose the earth 
put man on it, even a rebellious man, to save it. Amen. If a God could create the magnitude of this world, why would he worry about the earth? Because the only thing of value on the earth was a human being. And our Lord died and rose again to affirm that the God who created the world, Paul of Athens, also called Jesus from the realm of death. Death, be not proud. Thou art an enemy long ago defeated. Amen. That's our faith. If he rose from the dead, that should transform our whole existence. Amen. If not, we're talking to ourselves. And most of the time we lose ground when you do that. Thank you.